Well, good day and welcome to the Northern Illawarra Uniting Church Sermon for this week, November 3rd, sometimes known as All Saints Day. Uh, it's good to be with you. Our church is Bull Eyes Chapel on a Hill, and we are here to make a way for people to come home to God. Our reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, starting in verse 28. This is the passage where Jesus speaks about the greatest commandment. Let me put the text up on the screen and I'll read it for us. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, well, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The word of the Lord. Well, in December of 2013, the national legislature of the Chinese government amended its law on older persons to require that their adult children visit aged parents often or risk being sued by them. Now, the amendment did not specify how frequently such visits should occur, but it does allow older parents who feel neglected by their children to take them to court. And the move comes as reports abound in that country of older parents being abandoned or ignored by their children. And an official, when the law came out, said at the time that it could lead to mandated supervised visits. <laughs> you can just imagine such a family gathering under the threat of litigation. Now, perhaps for some of you, this is a law that you can get behind, compel your children to visit you. Wouldn't it be nice if we could compel people to love us, to pay us attention? But we know that this is not how it works. Love cannot be commanded. It cannot be compelled. I mean, we try, obviously, with passive aggression, manipulation, guilt tripping, withholding. Maybe we've tried all of those. And we can compel certain actions, maybe. But to demand love from the heart, that's not something that we can do. Tell everyone to love their neighbor. Well, if love was just one more obligation, one more thing to do, then this command becomes an impossibility. Uh, philosophers like Soren Kierkegaard point this out. Love must be given as a gift, he says, so it cannot be commanded. But love is also our duty, our highest obligation. So this is a, a paradox, love, a gift and an obligation. How can it be both? But we don't need philosophers, do we? We are all experts in the ways that love has failed us or fallen short. People who do the right thing, always serving, always giving, out of obligation, and their actions have the form of love, but underneath they seem to smack of anger and drudgery. Maybe this has been your life. But we also know the ways in which those who profess love in words fail to follow through. They write beautiful poetry, they declare their love easily, but when the time of testing comes, they cannot be counted on. So we see that in Jesus' conversation today that we read this discussion of love is no simple thing. Is Jesus commanding love? Is he just saying exactly what we've just been talking about, that love is just one more thing to do, one more obligation? Well, let's look today closely at what Jesus says. The conversation that we read takes place as Jesus is drawing close to the final confrontation with the leaders. He has arrived in Jerusalem and there are many encounters, we read in the chapter before this, with philosophers, legal scholars, theologians, and they're asking him about many things, his authority, about taxes, about resurrection. And they have so many questions and Jesus navigates all these controversies so well. But Jesus, if I'm honest, seems suspicious, defensive in these conversations. You get the sense that he knows, in fact, we're told that he knows, that the intelligentsia of Jerusalem are trying to trap him in some awkward answer. You can almost sense the relief in the passage that we just read 
when someone comes with what seems to be a genuine question. Which commandment is the first of all, this scribe asks. And Jesus doesn't try to get around it or evade it or send back another question. He answers it forthrightly and directly. He says, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second, he says, is this. It's like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus is clearly saying that love is a command, the greatest commandment. But I want us to note how he does it. Firstly, he begins with a traditional introduction from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, sometimes known as the Shema, Hear, O Israel. The Lord, my God, he says, the Lord is one. And when he says this, he's telling us that God is not one piece of reality, but God encompasses all of reality. The God he speaks of is the Savior of Israel, the Savior who revealed himself when he heard the people suffering in slavery and came down to free them. This one God is the God who is above all and through all and in all in creation and acts on behalf of his people. He is the God who is and the God who loves. This is the God whom we are commanded to love with our whole being, the one who is in all things. Now, like I said, this verse comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, but, but Jesus develops a little bit. The original verse, if you go back to Deuteronomy, says we're to love God with the whole heart, soul, and strength. And Jesus adds another word, though. He says, with all your mind as well. In some ways, I think Jesus is just expanding, saying this calling to total love is to be with our whole being, heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of us, all of us wrapped up, loving God. Our common image of God that I think uh, lives in the popular imagination is that God is like a boss or like the government or a distant parent who demands a bit of our time, attention on special days, or a tax obligation of some sort. There's the God part of our life, and then there's the rest. But Jesus' words, the words of the Shema, give no hint of some kind of partial or part-time relationship. It is a total enraptured, complete entwinement. It's total, it's an unashamed love affair. All of God with all of ourselves. But then Jesus does something that had not been done before. He's quoted from the Shema, which would have been expected. But then he takes that ancient command, the heart of Israel's faith, and ties it to another command, a little less central to Israel's own self-understanding. It's a fragment of a sentence that you can find in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus tells the question of these two commands, love of God and love of neighbor, are like each other and they are both together the most important. Love of God and love of neighbor. So that means that we see our neighbor in the same great web of existence that we see God and we see ourselves. And even this little phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, seems to wrap us up in the great tapestry of love. God, ourselves, our neighbor, God, ourselves, our neighbor, this great circle, this great tapestry of existence bound together in love. Well, this is beautiful, right? But it's also confounding. It increases or strengthens the paradox we talked about. On the one hand, this vision of love is so encompassing, so all-consuming that it takes our breath away. Jesus' vision of love between God and us and neighbor has shaped the world. But on the other hand, it only deepens our problem. How can such an all-consuming love be commanded? How can we obey such a law? How can we be made not just to love God, but our neighbor as well? Well, in some ways, we need to see the enormity of what Jesus is suggesting. He's not asking for one simple act of kindness or love to volunteer occasionally to help others. He is proposing an entirely new way of being in the world, an entirely new framework. Now, the scribe who asks Jesus the question sort of gets it. He applauds Jesus for naming love over and above the surface actions of religion. But Jesus then says something interesting. He brings up the kingdom, the kingdom of God. He says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. It's so interesting. Jesus doesn't say you have almost understood or you have done enough or you've almost done enough. Jesus says you are not far, not far from the kingdom of God. He's talking about geography. 
has almost arrived. He has moved into the kingdom. He's almost there. It's less like Jesus is giving him one more to do. It's more like he's describing the whole of life, the very fabric of reality, and inviting this man to step into it. Love is not one more to do. It is a whole new way of existence. For Jesus, the command to love is not a discreet demand. You must love this time or this place or this person. Instead, it is a whole new framework, a whole new government, a whole new kingdom of love. Love as a, as a currency, love as a language, love as a hat, but love as the law of the land. But maybe even deeper than that, love as a new reality. Love is simply the way that things work in God's kingdom. Less like the law of doing the right thing and, and more like a natural law, the law of thermodynamics or the law of entropy or the law of gravity. When Jesus speaks about the law of love, he is describing less something that we do and more like a new world that we live in. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this. I'm not sure if this is helpful, but I, I love the old Looney Tunes cartoons. My son loves them as well. We watch them together on YouTube sometimes. You know, the ones with uh, Elmer Fudd and Wiley Kite and Bugs Bunny. Now, one of my favorites, and this is the sort of thing that happens all the time in these cartoons, I remember one where Bugs Bunny is being chased by Yosemite Sam, that little red cowboy with the red beard and the guns blazing. And Yosemite Sam keeps chasing Bugs in this particular cartoon up and down a ladder onto a diving board or some such thing, way up high in the sky. And every time he chases Bugs up there, Bugs does something weird with gravity and he tricks Yosemite Sam into falling off the board. He hands him an anvil or something like that and the Yosemite Sam comes crashing to the ground. So this goes on and on. But the very last scene, Yosemite Sam is finally done with all of this. Uh, he grabs a saw and runs up and ties Bugs Bunny up, puts him on the end of the diving board and starts to cut the board so that it will fall off and he'll be done with this. But wouldn't you guess it? The moment he cuts the board, instead of the board with... Uh, Bugs standing on it. It's the platform that collapses and Bugs and the board are simply suspended there in midair. And what I love about this cartoon is that Bugs looks at the camera and says, I know this defies the law of gravity, but uh, you see, I never studied the law. You see, Bugs is able to move through this cartoon world with a different set of laws. He doesn't submit to the law of gravity, but to a total other law, maybe the law of comedy, I don't know. But in a strange way, I think, I mean, I hope you get this, in a strange way, I think that's what Jesus is inviting us into as well. A whole new set of realities where God, you, and our neighbors are fundamentally existing in a different relationship with one another. What's up is down and what's down is up. What should collapse remains and what should remain collapses. You see, our world, the world that we live in, is ruled by the law of gravity, of give and take. It's filled with demands and expectations. The law says that we haven't done enough. The law says that you only get what you work for. The law says that if someone gets you, you get them back. The law says that other people are going to get one up on over us unless we watch out. It tells us that our personality defects are going to be the end of us, the end of our story that we're going to be found out, that we're going to be judged, that we'll die alone, that everything we have done will die along with us. And God, this law tells us, and other people exist as objects to be used or simply obstacles to be overcome. We're all in the business in this world with its laws of fighting and fixing and fleeing each other. We do the same with God. It's the law. It's the way the world works. It's the law of the land. But I hope you hear what I'm saying when I say this. I, I like to think of Jesus winking at us a little bit like Bugs Bunny and telling us that he never studied that law or rather he studied a deeper law in fact he wrote it love is indeed a law but Jesus wrote that law and he fulfilled it when he laid down his life for the world he instituted a new regime a new kingdom where love is the law of the land. He looks at you and me and receives us. He does not see us as objects or obstacles. And all he asks is that over time, when we move into this kingdom, that we start to see our neighbor in the same way, not as an object to be used or an obstacle to overcome or an other to avoid, but simply to accept them just as beloved as you are. And maybe also to start to see God in the same way as well. 
not as a means to an end, but as the highest end in himself. Look, Jesus says it doesn't matter how you enter this new kingdom. Find your way. Experience love. Love your neighbor. Love God. But once you enter, you'll find that it's not really a law at all in this kingdom. It's actually freedom. Friends, we are not far from the kingdom of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.